Well, then we come to episode six, I believe, in this critique of Hume's argument against belief in miracles. This diagram here now I have made sort of considers Hume's argument as if it was a black box with certain inputs. Up here, our knowledge of the ordinary course of nature. Thus, earlier in this series, I spoke of what there's experimental evidence for. Alleged miracle is the lower input. Something contrary to the ordinary course of nature. Put these as inputs into the argument. And we come up, according to Hume, with a skeptical conclusion. Not likely. Now, is this ever valid? I think it actually is valid a lot of the time. And there's nothing here particularly strange going on that a reasonable Christian does not himself, in fact, himself or herself, work according to a lot of the time. There's a difference between uh, Christian faith, for example, and general credulity. Christians are not supposed to be credulous people. And I've even got a Bible verse I wanted to draw your attention to as part of all this. That's Proverbs uh, 14.15 in this scripture book that talks about what's wisdom and what's not. What does 14.15 say now? A simple man believes anything, but a prudent man gives thought to his steps. And this has an ap application to reports of the marvelous and the miraculous. I think a prudent person will not, in fact, believe most of them um, that are out there in the world. And Christians, well, instructed Christians at least, need not be and are not, in fact, credulous people. And Hume, growing up in a rather Christian country, Scotland, shows some awareness of this, but I don't think he is sufficiently aware that there's a difference between uh, Christian faith and mere credulity. But anytime you've got a valid argument or an argument which has a sphere of cases in which it's valid, it cannot be limited to just one application. In other words, I'm saying that input other things besides alleged religious miracles in here, and you might come up with the same conclusion. Not likely. Not just miracles of religions. Also, quite apart from irreligion, there's out there a lot of superstition, occultism, uh, credulous belief in psychic phenomena. But actually, also, I draw your attention to what about evolution? At least evolution as a comprehensive theory that is supposed to be refuting God or the God hypothesis. Now, you see, belief in evolution in that sense requires some belief in things that are not according to the current observable course of nature. It requires 
evolution of intelligent life way back when, where it didn't exist before. Not something we see happening with unintelligent species today. And way further back, abiogenesis, which is just a fancy term, you can look it up, means the generation of non-life, or the generation of life from non-life. This, although they talk about this happening to get life started sometime in the distant past, is not something we observe happening in the ordinary course of nature today, like uh, uh, life being generated from non-life in a pond on a fine summer's day, for example. So, it does seem a little miraculous, doesn't it? And knowing philosophy and philosophers as I do, I thought of the case of Anthony Flew. Now, among other interests of his, great 20th century philosopher, Anthony Flew, Britisher, and among other philosophy interests he had, he was a Hume scholar. He had other interests and specialties in philosophy as well. And towards the end of his life, having been during his philosophy career an atheist, he all, all of a sudden announces no longer, he's no longer an atheist, he is a deist now. Now, a deist, of course, is merely somebody who is theistic, believes in God, without going further and assenting to the truth of any revealed religion. And I guess in Anthony Flew's case, Christianity, he was emphatic in saying, okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not an atheist anymore, I'm a deist. This does not mean... I have turned into a Christian, or I'm ever going to. And I have to wonder the, if Anthony Flew's Hume scholarship was part of the reason that moved Anthony Flew towards this conclusion he came to late in life. In other words, as a good Humean, let's say, he disbelieved in miracles and thus disbelieved he thought reasonably in any revealed religion. Well, um, this, uh, as I say, a valid argument tends to have application in more spheres than the inventor of it thinks of at first. And uh, there's something, as I say, a little miraculous about a faith that, uh, I'll even put it in those terms, a faith that evolution, excluding God, is the comprehensive explanation for life, the universe, and everything. Well, particularly biological life is what, of course, biological evolution focuses on. So, um, there will be further episodes. I think I'm going to um, get into a term as a theologian, since I have done theological studies as well as philosophical studies. I'm going to, uh, in a future video, give some consideration to the topic of miracles in Scripture and the context in which they appear, their purpose in the Christian revelation, and uh, accepting, as I say, that Hume's argument against the miraculous, the reasonableness of belief in the miraculous, has a certain general validity, explain why, nevertheless, I accept that the scripture miracles 
a factual that they really did happen. Well then, till next time.